lots of the research projects have so many issues in common. Um, they're all dealing with displacements of different kinds of refugees, of people who are displaced by the developments that are taking place in city infrastructure, issues of mobility and transport, issues of disasters, different kinds of disasters, flooding, which come from climate change sometimes, earthquakes and so on. And so there are lots and lots of commonalities. And so, you know, lots of issues are, are common to all the projects. Because many refugees can only afford to live in informal settlements, they will often live in uh, very poor conditions. Their housing will not be a very good quality. They might not have access to their own toilet or even a communal toilet. They might not have a kitchen so they have to cook indoors. From that creates all sorts of health problems. If there's flooding in the informal settlements because of lack of drainage infrastructure, for example, they might be exposed to skin problems. So in Kampala, about 60% of people are walking for their journeys to, in and out of the city. But most of the infrastructure is actually concentrated on motorised transport. So the actual infrastructure for walking is really poor. And the challenge around that is it's actually leading to serious problems for those people. So dying every year from actually just moving around the city is quite a severe problem and it's something we need to really address. Women particularly face increasing amounts of violence in public spaces. There's a huge amount of patriarchy and even misogyny embedded in their everyday experiences of the city. So we focused on Kerala because of this paradox. Women's lack of access to infrastructure, particularly water, sanitation, electricity, public transport. These are aspects and these are spaces where violence is particularly pronounced against women. So we know that the world needs to reduce its energy consumption and we know that the world is urbanising in Africa and Asia. But how we put these two together is, is less known. Some of the energy interventions that have already been introduced historically in low-income communities, they're perhaps of poor quality. They were perhaps rushed in installation. There's no repair or follow-up. Communities weren't consulted as to whether this was an intervention that they wanted or, or educated about useful, it. Or weren't educated how to use it. So, you know, so, so the lack of connection in these relationships is having an impact on the ability to, to achieve this goal of meeting the, meeting the service needs of urban populations. We're working in two different countries, um, two different cities. We're working in Kathmandu in Nepal and Tacloban in the Philippines, both of which were affected by serious disasters in recent years. Philippines, um, Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, which killed about 6,000 people and damaged several hundred thousand houses. And the Gorkha earthquake in Nepal in 2015, which killed around 8,000 and again destroyed several hundred thousand houses. There isn't very much external assistance or sometimes none at all. Um, the the humanitarian agencies generally only reach a very small proportion of those who are affected in major disasters. The reason why we chose to investigate much further a specific infrastructure program in Ethiopia is mainly related to the country over the last 15 years having established one of the most ambitious top-down mega infrastructure programs. History has taught us that these big infrastructural programs often driven by engineering expertise and very solid uh, technocratic understanding of how they function, often fail us at very specific points where they interface with the city system, uh, with other infrastructures, and most importantly, with people. In Lahore, the focus is on the displacement that's occurred due to a 27-kilometer rapid transport system that's called the Orange Line Metro Project. As a result of this, tens of thousands of people have been displaced from their homes, or the places of work. In Colombo, our focus is on a drive by the Colombo Municipal Council to move working class communities from the center of the city into high rise apartment buildings on the outskirts of the city. And in both cases, what we're interested in is the life after displacement and how it's disrupted long lasting associations and networks of kinship and care, which are essential for working class communities to thrive and uh, for, their, for their survival. Because this is a comparative study between the two cities, we've worked very closely with both of our local partners in each city to develop a shared methodology. In both cities, we're applying qualitative methods with focus group discussions and key informant interviews with refugee households. So we've worked together to develop the tools for the focus group discussions and the interviews. Uh, we will also be interviewing key stakeholders from other sectors, for example, 
uh, government officials, humanitarian agency workers, health practitioners as well to get another perspective. We've been doing digital storytelling, so a bit like this today. We've been videoing particular people in the spaces we're working in. In one of the case study sites in Nairobi, we've been dealing particularly with businesses in, a, in the central business area and the effect that the transport around them at the moment is affecting them personally in terms of pollution affecting their health in the shops where they have to work, but then also how it's dissuading people from visiting that area and being, becoming customers for them. Our project looks at how to connect aspects of everyday violence against women going from the private spaces to the public spaces of the city. And we aim to do this through a number of scales and number of methods. One of the methods that we are particularly interested in is to use digital technologies, because digital technologies now are part of the infrastructure of a city. And women's lack of access to digital technologies, and particularly knowledge of what are the hotspots of violence in the city, reinforces forms of marginalization that they might face. It's quite difficult in, within South Africa to build trust because for many, many years, the government has um, made promises that they haven't kept. So what we tend to do is go and visit community leaders, introducing the project, and then asking the community leaders to ask the local community for their permission to come and speak with them. And then it's just about relationships and trust building and really listening to people and hearing their stories, whether it answers your questions as a researcher or not, hearing what they have to say. You get a lot of the answers that you're looking for for the research, but you also give people an opportunity to voice some of the frustrations they have that they haven't been able to really speak to anyone about. We've sought to take a multidisciplinary approach. We've got social scientists, engineers, hazard scientists of various kinds, humanitarian practitioners, all as part of the project. And recognising that actually rebuilding a house involves all sorts of factors. You know, it's economical as well as technical. There's the local environment to take into account. There's institutional rules and regulations. There's economics and access to finance. So we wanted a research team that could capture all of that. It takes quite a lot of work to get everybody on the same page when they're coming from such very, very different disciplines with different working methods. For us, the key aspect is to try to bring three groups or three interested parties together. So bring people who've been displaced, the civil society groups who do advocacy work for them, and then the politicians and policy makers. All three of these groups have become very interested in the work that we are doing. We'd like to use this kind of opportunity to make sure that there's a lot of learning between civil society groups and the people who've been displaced, but also to kind of think about it in terms of what would be the best way then that these demands can be put forth to policy makers. So we are uh, really excited at the prospect that already the people that we want to target have become so interested and it's, it's happened in an organic way rather than us having to go door to door and get people to come together. It's, it's happening naturally as we go. So we hope that this um, research will be really useful for the municipalities in each city. The information we gather will help to supplement their efforts. Similarly, in Nairobi, we think this could be really useful for humanitarian agencies that work with the refugee communities. It should also feed into broader global dialogues around how to address uh, the needs of urban refugees. Solving the transport issue is not just going to be good for the actual residents that live there, but it could also improve business and the business environment in the city centres. Beyond that, within the cities, we're also working with sort of higher level policy groups as well. So we're, we're working with the two uh, transport authorities in Kampala and Nairobi and feeding the ideas back to them. We come up with a scheme that they can just roll out or try, even if it's only temporarily, and just see what difference it makes. We've been working with the UN Share the Road, so part of UN Habitat, and they want to use the school children uh, case study as part of their toolkit around sustainable transport planning for school kids. So we'll be feeding into that kind of thinking that goes much more broad than our project. What we're looking at is energy innovations that are taking place in government supported housing for low income communities. So how does government partner with the private sector to provide forms of energy intervention? How do low-income communities, how are they involved in that decision-making? Are they consulted? How can we make these relationships work more effectively so that uh, energy innovation that's put in in low-cost housing is useful for those communities, but that it also ticks the box of government and also works for energy entrepreneurs? The Ethiopian government has a good reason to be proud of. Uh, they're really thinking very hard how they can 
govern various uh, infrastructure uh, delivery mechanisms in such a way that they come closer together. And very recently, for example, established a joint ministry unit that only cares about joining up different sectoral programs, which happen in very uh, diverse areas. We have interviews, the very traditional interviews, where we talk to women and ask them about how they experience the city. But we also follow them around with a particular safety app that has been popularized recently called Safety Pin. And we ask them to map their everyday experiences of violence through that safety app. So we get safety audits of routes and roads and any kinds of urban spaces in the city. Uh, the planners are also thinking about creating safety corridors. And this is where these two can come together. It gives us a way of creating a space for discussion with policymakers to talk to them and even debate why a particular space might become the hotspot of violence. The UN has a very strong presence in India, and they're also very well connected with, the, with our project partners. So they have shown keen interest in taking the research findings to input into their safe city policies. This is only halfway through the project, but we're beginning to see people really engage and very welcoming and open towards our findings, which is always a good sign. And we hope that we can take it forward. It's a very long process, disaster recovery. Um, we could question whether you can say whether people have recovered at all, actually. But you know, three, four, five, six years isn't really very long for, especially for poor households who are more or less having to do it with their their own resources and their own, their own contacts and opportunities and skills. I'd like to see a, a transformation in the way that the humanitarian shelter sector does its work. That it doesn't see itself as an implementer, which is largely what it does these days, but it sees itself as an enabler. And it finds ways of enabling many more people to, to, to recover in their own ways. There have been sort of gaps between civil society groups and the displaced people. And if we can fill in these gaps, that can really help with stronger advocacy for the future. Low income dwellers, their aspirations for energy are not to have something different to what wealthier citizens might have had. Um, they, they don't want to have some energy intervention that is designed for poor people. They want to be able to access the electricity grid because they see that that is part of being a citizen of this country, of this city. That's part of being involved in um, infrastructural activity. So, the, and, in, and in both settings, being given an energy intervention that is different or that is designed for poor people is something that is very much a turn-off. Um, and there's a need to integrate low-income people into the same electricity grid or the same kind of infrastructure grids as wealthier parts of the city. Mm, most definitely. The thing about social change and even built infrastructure change. And, you know, we use infrastructure in very broad ways. People are bits of infrastructure as well as pipes and cables and so on. What I think we'd like to see is that, you know, those benefits are spread and democratised a bit throughout communities, that they're not captured by the well-off and that city life has improved, if in small ways, for the majority of the people and the people who live in low-income settlements and for women and for those people who are not doing very well.